Michael Hess. I am the current Drupal security team lead. I'm a solutions architect lead at the University of Michigan. I still don't know what that title means. I support around 900 sites at the university on the hosting platform we've built there. And I support around 500 sites for side work that's not related to the university. I've been, I don't know, 10 years in Drupal, 11 years in Drupal, maybe slightly longer than that. Uh, I've been on the security team for, I don't know, five years, I want to say. And I build or consult on around 100 largest sites a year. Largest, in my words, are they get more than 200,000 visitors a month. So that depends on your definition and the scale you're normally working on. Cool, that's working. Uh, we're going to go a little bit of an overview of what the Drupal security team is, what it does, how it works. We're going to then cover what the Drupal security team refers to as SAO5. And we're going to then do a quick overview of best practices and hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end. In fact, I'm going to make sure there's time for Q&A. This is a little different from other presentations that I'd like everyone to pull out their cell phones and text the phone number on the screen with a four-digit code corresponding to do you brush your teeth. So if you brush your teeth, Text 4483, if you do not, 2983, and if you don't happen to have any teeth, well, that's 6276. No, this is not a spam service. This is a phone number owned by the University of Michigan. It is not a third party service. Those who were in my class are familiar with how this works. And I'll leave this up for another minute, and then we'll keep going. You will not get a response back or you shouldn't get a response back. OK. I'm going to go ahead to the next slide in. OK. It may take it a second to send. We're in the bottom area of a building. I'm going to give this another 10 seconds. OK, security in Drupal. Drupal has a dedicated security team of around 42 people, and they're around the world. The security team is entirely a volunteer group. Some companies will pay and sponsor time for work done on the security team, but it is not a paid position by the Drupal Association or any other entity directly. As a general rule, what we typically spend our time doing is resolving reported security issues in a security advisory. Those are the emails you get on Wednesdays. We provide assistance for contributed module maintainers in resolving their security issues. We provide some documentation, uh, both on how to write secure code and how to secure your site. And we also help the Drupal.org infrastructure team keep Drupal.org itself secure. Um, if you don't subscribe to the security team newsletters, commonly called uh, SAs, I would sign up for them. They let you know when there's security issues with Drupal and or its contributed modules. They come out on Wednesdays. There can be a lot of them, so just be aware of it. I would not set a filter for them, only because you might miss something important. Um, let's take a step back, though, and look at the web. This is from OWASP, which is the Open Web Security Project. These are the top 10, in order, things that go wrong in Drupal. Oh, I'm sorry, not Drupal, in the web in general. So the biggest thing that happens bad in the web is injection of some sorts. Most of the time, that is SQL injection. But there's other types of injection. Um, interestingly enough, if you look at how Drupal's security vulnerabilities break down, well, before we do that, Keep in mind third-party components. It's on this list. Uh, if you use a third-party library, you should be aware of when there are security issues with that third-party library. Things like CK Editor, Civi CRM, um, anything you put in your libraries folder, you should keep track of what's going on with. Drupal breaks down like this. We've had 61 cross-site scripting issues in 2014, 42 access bypass, 13 information disclosure, and four cross-site requ request forgeries. This covers all of Contrib. So very little SQL injection. Uh, if you look at how this is broken out, 
We've got a lot on number three and a couple on number eight. And either two or seven is what the uh, access bypass and information disclosures would fall under. So let's talk about the title of this section. And before we begin, was a site you work on compromised by SAO5? And you should just be able to send another text message to the phone number you sent it to earlier. And we'll give this another 10 seconds. So I should probably define what SAO5 was. SAO5 was a critical security vulnerability, and it was a SQL injection. Um, SQL injection is one of the scarier ones, which I'll cover in a second as to why. Um, but it compromised a lot of sites because people who did not update to the fixed version of Drupal within about eight hours were vulnerable. And if you hadn't updated within, say, 72 hours, your site was 90% compromised. 90% sure your site would have been compromised. Everybody done voting? Let's see. The unsures are a little, oh, oh. So four yeses, six unsures, and six noes. That's pretty good. What is SQL injection? SQL injection is basically lets an attacker run a SQL query against your database. This is really bad because your database, whether you're running Drupal or something else, your database is where all your data is. It's where all your security configuration is held. So if you have the ability to run SQL injection, in the database, you can do whatever Drupal can do through the web interface. That includes things like allowing an attacker to add a user and modify that user's role. So don't bother guessing someone's password. Create your own password and give them the admin role. Letting an attacker change the email password, the email addresses or passwords. So here's a fun one. How many people have ever used the email reset link in Drupal? It sends you a new password. So an attacker can go in and change the email address associated to UID1, the admin account, and then request a new password for themselves, and then log into your site. You would never know they had done this, because unless you go and look at UID1's email address, you don't know what they've done. And of course, once they get logged into your site, they can then change the email address back. allows an attacker to update a URL's payment page. So depending on if you're running an e-commerce site, you may be sending users to a third-party server to collect payment data, and then that third-party server sends a signed request back to you. An attacker can go in, change the address of that third-party server, and then your visitors are sent to their server buying whatever it is from them, they get their, your customer's credit card numbers, and then that data gets sent back to the, uh, that data gets back, sent back to, I'm blanking on this, back to the, the original Drupal site. And you have no idea that your credit cards of numbers have been stolen or your customer's credit card numbers have been stolen until the end of the month when there's no money in your bank account from those purchases that were made. I've seen this happen. Um, it's quite interesting to watch. And the one that most people don't think about here is changing content. So if you were able to compromise a site, why would you edit the content? I mean, you could embarrass the customer. You could go and put in, you know, hacked by whatever group name they want to put in. You could do something like, you know, put hidden little images at the bottom of the screen or little small images to be kind of malicious. Or you could put JavaScript in there and build a keylogger. That's always fun. So you now are getting keylogs on that site. Here's the fun thing with that. If you change a user's password and log in as them or change an email address or add a user account, well, you're going to figure it out eventually. The site owner at some point will log into that site, look at the list of users, and there'll be one there that doesn't belong. Or the uh, users will go and they will, you know, they'll, they'll see that the email address was changed. Or if you're using it to send spam, the, you know, your hosting provider will come to you and say, hey, your server's sending out spam. We're going to shut you off. But putting a JavaScript keylogger in there, that's really hard to find, uh, especially if you don't know where to look. 
So that happens quite a bit on all sorts of attacks, but it's one of the ones that stands out. And finally, if you can do it via the web interface, and even some things you can't do via the web interface, an attacker can do it with SQL injection. SQL injection is one of the scarier um, vulnerabilities out there for this reason. Any questions so far on this? I'm going to stop and ask for questions periodically because I don't want to have everybody batch questions till the end. Plus, I need a drink. Okay. So um, it wasn't a Drupal site, but this happened to a site uh, my company did maybe eight years ago. And the SQL injection just happened through like the web form. And at the time, I think the solution we did was just to kind of limit, put a set of character limit. I take it that's probably not enough anymore? No, that's, that's not enough anymore. <laughs> um, the best way to filter against SQL injection is to prevent it from ever hitting the database. And we're going to kind of talk about what happens there. One of the biggest issues with SQL injection is it's easy to exploit. So cross-site scripting is actually really hard to exploit. It requires timing. It requires certain actors to do certain things in a certain order. There's all sorts of chained events that have to happen. Having said that, it's not difficult to necessarily do, but it's a waiting game. You're going to do something. You're going to wait for another actor to do something. It, there's, there's a time gap in there. Um, with SQL injection, pretty much you find the, the URL on a site that's vulnerable to SQL injection, you send a specially crafted request, and you've now injected SQL into that site. What's interesting is that if you sit down in a beginning PHP class, typically the examples that they start you off with are all vulnerable to SQL injection. In fact, if you go online now and look at how to learn PHP in MySQL, pretty much all the examples you see are vulnerable to SQL injection. In Drupal, in pretty much anything you do, don't trust user content. User content is bad. You should assume that your users are evil and wish to do you harm. I realize it's not a very positive thing to say, but some of your users will be evil, and some of them will wish to do you harm. So if you start from that perspective, then you will make sure that what you're doing is safe or you'll at least try to make sure what you're doing is safe. So let's talk about Drupal's database API. If you remember way back in the beginning of this presentation, there were some, we, we went through the common database, the common web vulnerabilities. And SQL injection is one. SQL injection is one because, one, it's really easy to exploit. And most of the examples online don't adequately protect you from it. So you have people copying code that is vulnerable. Do you have a question? Um, so what's nice about Drupal's database API is when it's used correctly, it prevents SQL injection. How many people have used dbquery before, or dbselect, or any of the Drupal database APIs? So if you use it correctly, you use the placeholders, you prevent against SQL injection. That's awesome. In the case of SA05, the database API is actually where the problem was. So the very library that was written to prevent SQL injection was the place in which the SQL injection was coming from. And trust us, the irony wasn't lost. <laughs> so a little bit this is how this has to do with open source in nature. The, miss, the code in question was committed, I think, like right around New Year's, if I remember, about seven or eight years ago. It's been sitting in Drupal for the last seven or so years, meaning that every Drupal site out there, from whitehouse.gov to um, Henry Ford Community College, has been vulnerable to SQL injection before this went out. In the same way that there's a bunch of other open source vulnerabilities that have been coming out recently, they've all been vulnerable, some of them for a long time. The SSL vulnerability, that was there for a long time. Um, and so part of it is mitigation of vulnerabilities, but part of it is we accept the risk that when we run software, there's vulnerabilities. And part of what we do is we stay on top of what those vulnerabilities are, and we patch them. Speaking of patching them, 
That's all it took to fix the problem. That's literally all it took to fix the problem. The first line up there, for those of you who don't read patches, is what the code was that was vulnerable. The second line is all you had to do to fix the problem. Yeah? The SSL one was also one line. Yep. So, you know, there were a lot of questions on whether or not these backdoors were put in by government entities or you know, whether coders were purposely putting backdoors into sites. Honestly, this was just a lack of a good code review. That's all this was. And that's one of the reasons why this particular vulnerability was so easy for people to exploit. You show people this patch, it didn't take long for people to figure out what manner to exploit it with. So one of the things that I've had the privilege of seeing is the common ways in which this was exploited. And it really came down to two different branches. There was the mass exploits, people basically running a script on as many sites as they could, as quickly as they could, to compromise as many sites as they possibly could. And the other ones were very targeted attacks. They were going after a specific target. They knew that XYZ site had this type of data, they knew it wasn't patched, and they were trying to get that data. They didn't care about compromising the site in the long term. What they really wanted was the data on that site. And so the targeted attacks in some ways are scarier because you know, if, you're a, if you're one of the common attack patterns, it's kind of easy to find that. If you're not one of the common attack patterns and you just happen to be attacked and it was something custom for your site, that might be very hard to find. So the most common thing was changing the password of the email address on UID1. That happened a lot. It was re it's really easy to do. I'm going to actually give a demo, hopefully in a minute, on how to do it. Really easy to do. Uh, another thing that happened is adding files to the file system via the menu router table and file put contents. So the menu router table, for those of you who've ever had to clear your cache when writing hook menus, the menu router table is what is part of the component that gets built when clearing that cache. And so people were basically injecting code into the menu router table. Then they could call a URL on your site and it would do something. In this case, run file put contents. And it would put a file on your file system. There's two issues with this. One, if the web server has the ability to write to the file system on your server, you've done it wrong. So if you're running on cPanel, there's a problem because the web server by default on cPanel installs has the ability to write to the file system, meaning that if I gain access to Drupal, I can add files to the Drupal file system. Or even more fun, I can edit Drupal itself from within Drupal. I can write PHP code in Drupal that edits Drupal that's running Drupal. Yeah. So if the web server has access to the file system, there's a whole other large set of vulnerabilities that get op opened up to you. A uh, couple people, couple instances of adding users and giving that user admin access. There was like mega admin, I think was one of the common accounts that got created. And it got the role of like mega, role, mega admin role or something. Um, installing a PHP backdoor, enabling the PHP module, and then creating a node with PHP in it. A uh, couple of them actually patched the vulnerability. This was interesting. So they'd come into the site. They drop, a PH, they drop files on the file system. So they own the site. They were using them to spend out spam. And then they patched the vulnerability so that someone else could come in and compromise the site that they just compromised. So you had people who were like, hey, um, I didn't patch my site, but my, patched, my site is patched. Thanks. <laughs> Wait, what? No, 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 no. No, that's not, that's not the way it works. So, it was interesting because you know you would actually see a bunch of sites that were patched against it, and they were patched, you know, rather than nicely formatted PHP fixing the problem. It was like the line breaks were missing. It was not patched according to the real patch. So you might call them benevolent because they compromised your site and they were protecting you against somebody else compromising your site, but in reality they were after preventing other people from gaining access to your site so they could use it for themselves. Um, most of what the attacks were doing is, well, some of them, nothing happened. They just gained the access to the site and did nothing. And there's probably a large number of Drupal sites out there 
that have that are compromised in some way from this still. Um, some of them used it just to send spam. That's all they're doing is sending spam or hosting SEO spam. They were hosting, you know, files that they're pointed to on your domain for Google SEO purposes. So what did these what did this code actually look like? That's a fun one. That just changes the password. These are from Acquia's network, by the way. Um, apparently, I have 20 minutes left. Uh, these are from Acquia's network. Thank you. I think we're going to turn the sound off. SQL injection. SQL. <laughs> Audio injection? <laughs> so this was a nice one. This basically says, hey, we're going to add a new user account. Sorry, it's cut off on the end. But basically, figure out what the max user ID in the system is, and then add a new account with that new user ID. So basically, get the max UID from the users table, add one, and then insert a new account into the users table. And then this statement here, oh, insert into users ID role, set UID, that's the new UID that it found, and role ID 3 is the admin role. <coughs> Except you can't see that because, interesting, oh, there we go. And this was a fun one. This is basically just changing the email address. So this is probably one of the more stealthy ones because it changes the email address. And unless you actually look at UID 1's email address, you may not know that it was changed. And finally, here's the menu router one, where we're basically going to input something into the menu router table to have it do something. So next up, I'm going to show a demo of actually how to do this against a server. Um, it's a server. It's on the internet. It's running vulnerable code. I'm asking everyone to please behave. Uh, however, I will leave this server up at least through the weekend. So if you want to play with a vulnerable server, as long as you don't do things that might incur money spent by me, like sending spam or hosting really large files, etc., please feel free to use it for educational purposes. So I need to turn on video mirroring. And I'm going to lose like 90% of my display when I do this. And so here's a Drupal site. And if we do a drush from last uh, uh, speaker, drush status, you'll see that I am running a vulnerable version of Drupal. And I can go onto my hard drive and I've got two different ways to exploit this here. Let me get a login link for this site. So I'm logged in. Let's actually, before we do this, see if the site's already been exploited. No, this is correct. So I'm logged in. And I'm going to take this URL here. And I've got two different shell scripts on this server, injection.php and injection.py. These were pretty much downloaded from the internet. Yeah? Quick question. You just, uh, you just went and checked. It's already been compromised. You just one quick look and said, oh, no, it's fine. Correct. I'm just looking at the user account because that's the most common way to compromise it. It could be compromised in other ways. It absolutely could be. Somebody else in this room could already be on that server for all I know. Um, but. The injection mechanisms that I'm using change the username and password, so for demo purposes, I needed to make sure they weren't changed. So I've got injection.php and injection.py. One's a Python script, one's PHP. This isn't that hard. It's pretty easy code. It even fits on that screen. So this basically takes three arguments, the host, the username, and the password. So I literally can type Python injection.py host, test, test. I don't know if that's what it was supposed to do or not. Let's see if that worked. Where's the other Chrome tab? Doesn't look like it liked that. Let's try the other one.
Um, that's nice. I still have internet access. EC2. Oh, oh. Yes, because it's not just that URL. The site is actually at forward slash hack. Okay, just change the username and password to admin admin. So to prove that that actually did something, I can go back to my site and I can change the username. But let me run the Python code with the right URL now. And you can see that it is saying success, login now with user test, pass test. And I can go back in here. Got to find the right window. Refresh this and I'm now test as opposed to admin that I was a second ago. It's really easy to exploit that. What does this code actually look like? By the way, if I run the PHP code again, you'll notice that it changes the username to admin. So when I go back to this site, it was test. It's now back to being admin, password being admin. So that's why they were changing, that's why they were patching the vulnerability so that you, could, you couldn't basically fight with yourself on it or fight with other people. If we look at the PHP code, this is even simpler. All this is doing is update users, set name equal to admin, pass equal to URL encode, this whole big thing, which is Drupal's encrypted hash for the, word at, for the password admin, where UID equals one, and then some other stuff to prevent form API from causing problems. It's pretty simple. These are freely available online. Um, and that's where I got them from. I did not write these for this presentation. In fact, I left the original header on top. And the Python code is pretty similar, other than the fact it helps you, it lets you generate your own password as opposed to hard coding the admin password in there. So, and it's using a Python library called Drupal Hash to do that. So I will leave that server up for the rest of the weekend, but I am going to pull it down on Monday. Let's go back to Okay, so this is scary. Yes. There's not much you can do to protect against SQL injection other than to fix the SQL injection. If you were using some other mechanism for login, like LDAP logins, this wouldn't have done anything. Except the LDAP login module, I'm pretty sure, excludes user ID 1. So, I'm sorry? Usually. So, you might be able to figure around it, but yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things where if you're, if you're vulnerable to SQL injection, the best thing you can do is fix it. It's a scary issue. It was trivial to do that. It's trivial to find huge public lists of Drupal sites. It's fairly trivial to scan the internet and find Drupal sites. But let's look at some perspective. This was a major vulnerability, but it was the, the last major, major issue in Drupal was about seven, eight-ish years ago, and it wasn't nearly as major as this. Uh, this was one of the first highly critical uh, security advisories that we've released for core in a long time. Uh, this code has been sitting in Drupal since Drupal 7 betas. As far as we're aware, no one's been compromised by this prior to it coming out publicly. And we also have to talk about security. Nothing's 100% cure. No vendor can come to you and say, I sell you 100% secure product. It doesn't exist. What we do is we mitigate risks by using best practices. Best practices are fun. Who brushes their teeth? Brushing your teeth is a best practice. I'm not quite sure who is not brushing their teeth, but there's a dentist I know that would love to, get to, would love to see you. So brushing your teeth is a best practice. You brush your teeth every day so that you don't go to the dentist. There's no checklist you can do for security. There's no, you know, I'm going to check here, check here, check here, and I'm going to be done. There's no way to do that with security. It's a process. It's a methodology. It's not something you do when you're building your site. It's not a checkbox you can just check off and be done with. 
you have to continually be doing it. Um, which is why I hope everybody brushes their teeth. Continually doing security tasks is a best practice. Who didn't brush their teeth? Anybody want to admit it? <laughs> Don't let your mouth look like this. Keep your Drupal site secure, follow security best practices, and while you're at it, brush your teeth. <laughs> so some of the common best practices, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly so that we have time for uh, questions at the end. Some of the common best practices out there, everyone should know, use secured protocols. Make sure you're using HTTPS, FTPS or SFTP, SSH, etc. Also keep in mind, every change you make in your site, regardless of how small it might be, might change the security risk of your site. So somewhere in your workflow, when you're going to deploy something to your production server, think about that. Is what I'm doing opening up a larger security hole? Is what I'm doing going to create a larger attack surface? And am I OK with that? Is it worth it? Always use supported versions, if you can, of products. Speaking of which, Drupal 6. Time to start thinking about upgrading it. It's not going to be supported forever. Uh, it loses its support three months after Drupal 8 comes out. And finally, take and verify backups. So the best solution for this was, hey, if you didn't update your Drupal site within time, just restore a backup. Not everybody had backups. Also, keep your site updated. The Drupal security team releases our security advisories on Wednesday afternoons, sometimes early evening Eastern time. Look out for the emails. Keep your site updated. Uh, it's, the, it's the easiest thing you can do 99% of the time to keep things functioning. Yes, every now and then a security release might break backward compatibility. We really try hard to encourage contributor, contributor modules from not doing that, but it happens. Uh, the last really bad example I know of that was organic groups about a year ago, going from version 1 to version 2 as part of a security update, which required you to install the migrate module and do all sorts of fun things. Yes? My backbone does see crash. I'm sorry? My backbone does see crash. There's probably others. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure if you were getting to this, but um, from my perspective, the issue or the, the biggest concern that I had or the problem I had was not the initial security notice. Mm -hmm. Because you know Wednesday comes out, you come out secure notice. And yet it, it did say, you know, this is a you know it's a high security thing uh, in the initial sort of normal Wednesday release. The issue was that, you know, I've got I've got about 70 sites to deal with and I, I'm not set up to do like a mass you know update or anything. And it ended up taking me a couple of days to get to it. And, uh, and then it was and then it was two weeks later, which was when you gave out the big, holy crap, you guys are screwed, mm -hmm. you know, red, red alert notice, at which time some of the, ba I mean, you know, I have backups, but some of, the, some, some of them it's I have backups time. from a couple of days, which doesn't do any good, because the backup was from, you know, so that, that, that was really, it wasn't the initial, I mean, yeah, of course, pro problems happen, you can't cover everything, and you did issue the notice, but it just, I mean, it strikes me that the problem is that, the updated uh, notice said that, you know, you, you said within seven hours, right? Mm -hmm. It was like within seven hours. Well, the next one could be seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Seven seconds. And mm -hmm. you know, another couple of years. So not to mention, what if you're in Europe, you know, you're in a different time zone. It's three in the morning and you're asleep, you know? So we didn't know the extent of what this was going to be when it came out. Um, one of the things we did, and we've internally discussed how we're going to do a better job of notifying people that there's a major security release coming out. The Drupal security Twitter feed, the front page, was updated in advance saying, hey, on this Wednesday, you should pay particular attention to the security releases that are coming out, as opposed to every other Wednesday where most people get to it on Thursday. In the future, we're debating emailing all the users on Drupal.org was brought up as an example. Um, using more mechanisms of social media to let people know. You know, there's a whole group of people who still don't know this is even an issue. So, you know, people who got the message we sent out two weeks later, that was sent out because, hey, there's a lot of talk about what's happening and there's no central place to communicate it. It's on Drupal.org posts. It's on other 
computing sites. And so we decided we were going to send out a push basically saying, hey, this is what's going on. You should make sure you've updated it if you haven't already been compromised. Um, in the future, we need to find a better way when we know there's something that's going to be highly critical, like SQL injection, that people know in advance. You know, one of the things is, thank you, one of the things is with SQL injection is we end up with, you know, it's easy. It's, you can script it. You know, cross-site scripting in some ways can be way more dangerous, but it's much harder to exploit 100,000 sites or a million sites. I've got about three more slides, then I'll take more questions on this. Um, know your risk level and think about your risk level in terms of your site. Your blog site, your personal blog site is not nearly as high of a risk as a large site with a lot of traffic on it. So you and people are going to be more interested in compromising the large sites directly and they're going to script the blog sites. So be aware of what your risk is and how that plays into your security patterns. If you know there's a security release that affects a bunch of sites, prioritize. Um, if any of these abbreviations mean something to you, this takes on a whole other legal uh, area. If you have PCI data on your site and your site gets compromised, there's legal, there's financial, there's required notifications, same with HIPAA, there's I don't know why X, Y, Z is on here. This is borrowed this slide from somebody. Um, but if, you're, if you've got regulations that are watching over your site, then you should be aware of what the requirements are under those regulations as far as what you need to be doing for security. Um, some of them may require a web application's firewall in front of it, which can mitigate SQL injection, for example. Not always very well, but it can help. Do not use insecure hosting. This is the biggest issue we've run into, I've personally run into with helping clients, is they're on an insecure host. There's two different types, two different high level types of insecure hosting. There's the web server runs as the same user as the files are owned by. This is a common setup for cPanel. cPanel can be set up not to do this, but it's a common setup for cPanel. So the Drupal site itself, has access to modify its own files, meaning if I compromise the Drupal site in any way, shape, or form, I can modify the files on the file system. You can see how that could be really bad. The other one that most people don't think about is multiple sites on a server use a common site for all sites, common user for all sites. So if you fire up a Linux box at Amazon and you install 10 sites on that server, in fact, there's server examples I've seen here, I think from I'm not going to mention the group, but that we're doing this today, where they've got one web server and multiple sites running under that one web server. If I compromise one of those sites, I've compromised all the sites on that box. Even if I can't put files into the file system, all I've got to do is write two lines of PHP that read me the settings.php file, and now I've got database credentials. So I can then log into another site, and it's basically SQL injection. So if you're going to do this, you need to be aware that all the sites on your server need to have the same level of risk and need to be accessed by the same trusted group of people. So if you're going to give, in a college setting, students access to a server that has important sites on it, you're asking to get compromised. I work at a college. I know this. <laughs> um, and for the same reason, you should be very careful about using multi-site. Multi-site suffers the same problem. Apache is the same user for all the sites. I compromise one of the sites, I have all of the sites. Having said that, if you're running the identical multi-site with different theming or slight variations and it's not really multiple users, and the security risk profile across all the multiple sites is similar, then this might be a valid use case because it's much easier to update. Use a module that enhances security in your site. So there's a lot of modules out there, none protect against SQL injection that will help uh, increase the security of your site. Paranoia is a great module. It will prevent you from enabling the PHP module in a site. And you cannot disable paranoia. In fact, the only way to disable paranoia is to go into the database and remove paranoia. You probably can do it through Drush. Um, Two-factor authentication. 
something you have, something you know. You have your password. I'm sorry, you have your phone, which has a one-time token on it. You know your password. Um, and password policy is kind of nice because it lets you know, it, it enforces you, people to use strong passwords. Just a note, SQL injection isn't the only one uh, out there. There's other vulnerabilities that are out there and you should be aware of them. The biggest one that people miss is uh, allowing users to input dangerous HTML elements that leads to cross-site scripting. And finally, questions? Uh, sure. Uh, one, isn't it true that the security team actually knew about this problem for about a year? So there was a version of this issue reported publicly in the public issue queue. It wasn't described in a manner that made that flagged it as a security issue, and it got closed. So it was actually known publicly for a year. And one of the things we've done is redesigned the Drupal.org pages to report a security issue is now a button that shows up right on the side of the page to help direct those to the right place so they're seen. Um, but it was actually reported in public about a year earlier. Now WordPress has the simple one-click install update. Mm -hmm. It makes it real simple for its end users. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't Drupal come up with something like this so that for these critical types of security issues, you can have a one-click correct? It's a little bit about managing risk. It's also to do that requires the web server has access to file permissions. And so WordPress plugins get compromised a lot. The fact that they have, they can basically make the assumption they will have access to the file system makes it really easy to go down a path. Um, we somewhat have this with Drush. You can do a one click upgrade. It's not quite a click, but you can do a one button upgrade with Drush. Uh, Drupal 7, I don't think you can update core, but you can update modules if you want to give it your credentials to log into the box. Of course, if you're doing that over a non-encrypted channel, you probably should reevaluate some choices in there. Now let's just say that we didn't follow good practices, mm -hmm. and let's just say that somebody's site was hacked, you delete off the new users, you patch it, you look at it, you don't see any code, you installed hacked, you waited a while, nothing seemed to happen. Obviously, there's no guarantees that there's not something in the database. So How it can you tell? It, you can't, unless you're going to go through and review every content type, every file on the file system by hand, and every row in the database, basically. But it comes down to your risk level. If you're running a personal blog site, you probably can live with the risk that you didn't clean everything out. If you're running a site that houses medical records, you probably can't live with that risk. In fact, I'm pretty sure legally you cannot live with that risk. So it depends on figuring out where your risk level is and how much risk you as an individual or you as a corporation or you as a vendor are willing to tolerate. Um, and that's, that's the general you know, view of security always. You know, there are sites out there that pay people to sit on Wednesdays and wait for the releases to come out so they're patched within 20 minutes because they know that they can't tolerate that risk. Depending on the criticality of their site, they may take it offline while they're doing that so that it doesn't get exploited. And then there are blog sites that update once every three years, four years, longer. Um, I think Angie Webchick made the comment that this was one of the first security advisories that she applied immediately. She's on the security team. Uh, but for her own personal blog, it's probably way less of a target than, say, Acquia.com. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, uh, so sort of follow up on that. So um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I, I did have a situation where I, I, it was quite obvious that uh, a few of my uh, client sites had been nabbed because they did, they did just add, you know, add a new user. Um, but most of these sites are, I mean, they're small. They're basically very basic sites, nothing, you know, no real secure information or anything. Uh, it sounds like you're saying, I mean, in theory, they could have, the ones that did not have those signs could still be hacked, but it sounds like this would be a case of sort of the, the blast, where they just carpet bombed every possible Drupal site they could possibly find. And if I, I mean, you know, I, I, took, I took everything, I, every measure I could short of wiping the entire server and, you know, recreating the server itself. 
I mean, reset the database passwords, reset the, you know, all the, all the user accounts, all the email accounts, just everything. Um, and of course, you know, restore for backups whenever possible and apply the patch immediately and you know, all that stuff. Um, as well as, of course, clearing out these user accounts. I mean, again, there's no guarantees here, but given the level that I'm working with, it, is it, I mean, it's been a few months now. We, we want you to tell us that it's going to be okay. <laughs> so, if, if, you had to, if you had to basically put yourself on the risk pool, your risk is lower, it's not non existent. I mean, I have a couple of e commerce client sites. Those are the ones that I'm most concerned about, and those are the ones where I did wipe them and restore from backup. But, but now so, I'm thinking, well, what if they got into the, the root server itself, and so they're just sitting biding their time for six months? Or, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, you could, you'd drive yourself crazy. Yeah. Um, you know your priorities better now. <coughs> you know, what server you got to do first. So this is a bad thing that happened, but it was a good learning lesson. <laughs> I, I take care of one site. I got lucky. You know, I updated it real quick. Oh, probably you got like seven the clients. Will take yeah, you're, you're not. You know, you're not. Will probably, oh well, you learned a good lesson. Yeah. <laughs> well, so there, there's no. I can't. You know, I, as much as I'd like to pat everybody on the back and say you're all going to be fine, I can't do that. <laughs> um, in all likelihood, your you know, like your risk is lower because you found most of the issues. It looks like it was one of the drop by attacks from the examples from Acquia. But that doesn't mean they didn't log in and do something. Did you go through Watchdog and see the logins? Did you look at the Apache logs and see what they did? You can find their IP address pretty easily. What did, that, what, what did they do one, from that IP address? Did you look at Watchdog? What showed up in Watchdog? When you were resetting things, did you clear the Drupal salt? Um, that's one that typically gets missed. Um, you know, there's a Drush shell script that goes through and checks for common issues. Was that run? Um, there's a lot of things you can do. You know, if you don't have the ability to wipe the site, then you've just got to keep your eye on it. Yeah. If the site, if the attack vector, and this applies any system, and and that attack vector allows for remote code execution on the server. You, there's no, you cannot trust that server. To, there's no 100% guarantee. You have to, if you want to be completely 100% sure, you have to. You have to wipe it. And then you have to, and take only, and then inspect the data. Uh, again, it's about risk. You know, it, that's where, uh, that's where like if I knew there was a remote code execution, I would not trust that server ever again. The, the typical process I took is that if one of the servers, one of the sites that I was working on and it had anything more than low level risk assigned to that site, I actually didn't restore from backup the site. I wiped the server and did a fresh install of an OS. Because then I can say to my supervisors who are reporting to regulatory authorities in most cases, I'm 100% sure that was clean. I went from a backup, not 100% sure I'm. As sure as I can be that it was clean, I went from a backup prior to the event occurring, I wiped the OS that was running on it, I scrubbed any intermediary layers there were between that system. You know, also keep in mind some Drupal sites have access to other systems. So if you're working at an institution and you've given your Drupal site access to, say, an Oracle database of employees, and it might have a write connection there, that's a pretty high value target, even if it's just a read target. That's a fairly high value target. So you not only need to inspect what your Drupal site touches, but any of the interconnected systems that it might have access to. Um, you know, one of the issues we run into with boxes, not Drupal sites necessarily, but boxes that get compromised, is when they get on that box, they're effectively on your internal network. So what can they do from your internal network? Is there stuff that they can see? Is there boxes they can run? If they sniff traffic, what would they find? I have one minute. Yeah. So as we move into the, the mobile realm here with uh, mm -hmm. seven Drupal H in the future, uh, the CSRF is mm -hmm. a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. Could you just briefly talk about what, what exactly that help is used for and sure. how is it going to be exported? So I don't have a slide in front of me to show this, uh, but there's a very common pattern where you've got like a little Ajax screen, you've got a list of records, and you've got a delete button. 
and the delete button calls something like URL slash item slash item ID slash delete. And you press that button, and the item is deleted from your database. And in your code, you're basically saying, if user has access to delete this item, run this database query and delete the item. So here's the problem with that. Let's assume that I have access to delete items. I'm logged into this site. And sorry, Allison. Allison wants to delete some items. Well, she goes to the URL, slash item, slash item number, slash delete. It tells her access denied. So she sends me to a web page on the internet that she created that has IMG SCR equals my URL, slash item, slash item number, slash delete. I pull up her web page. I'm now loading those URLs, logged in as me to the origin site. And it's now actually deleting those items because it's trying to load an image. When I get her site, all I see is a bunch of broken images. And I email her, I'm like, hey, none of your images worked. And she looks at it and goes, <laughs> good. <laughs> so what CRS, CRSF tokens do is they put in a random string, which you'll see throughout Drupal, that basically Drupal generates it. The command is Drupal get token and Drupal set token. Um, and Drupal will verify it. So the code has to say, hey, does the user have access to delete it? Great. Is the token passed in valid? Yes. Now delete it. Uh, Drupal Core handles this another way, and it's not mobile friendly, unfortunately, and that's with the confirmation form. So when you delete a node in Drupal, it comes up and it says, are you sure you want to delete this? And then you press yes, and it's gone. If you look at the flag module in Drupal, the flag module, if you look at the URLs it generates, it generates these long random strings on the URLs. Those are CR CSRF tokens. Any other questions? I think I'm slightly over on time, but I don't think there's anything else in here. OK, well, thank you all for your time. <laughs>